Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm Ukrainian Canadian. Today is May 21st, 2024, and let's get to the map updates and news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So let's get to it, and there's lots of things to cover. So first of all, of course, I want to go in Kharkiv, where there is uh, this Russian incursion happening in the northern part of Kharkiv city, and also towards Vovchansk. So we can see that the last few days, there haven't been really massive gains. Again, what is expected is that the Russians will be able to gain some ground in open fields because there's no settlements, there's really no um, area that the Ukrainians can defend. So you can see that the Russians certainly will be stopped around the area of Staretsya in the Vovchansk front, uh, Prilipka and Vovchansk. So this entire area uh, in open fields, I'm expecting the Russians to be able to gain that ground because of how porous it is and there's absolutely no Ukrainian presence literally by the border right now. But the Russians will be stopped at the very first uh, settlements where the Ukrainians are present. So the biggest, I would say, gains for the Russians right now in this direction would be towards Vovchansk. You can see that the Russians have gained a little bit of uh, ground within the city and the northern part of the city. Let me remind my viewers that Vovchansk is a city of about 15,000 people prior to the war. So it's uh, nothing massive, but it's also not a really small village or settlement by any means. And we saw this weekend that the Russians occupied um, the hospital, which is located in the center of Vovchansk, and the Ukrainians baited Russian soldiers into this hospital. And then, from what I understand, they shelled the hospital with artillery, killing about 30 to maybe even 50 Russian soldiers in the process. So they were essentially baited and destroyed. Unfortunately, as well, uh, we are now witnessing more Russian uh, human crimes by the Russian military. I've seen a few pictures of Russians executing civilians in the streets of Ovchansk. And this is the reality. This is what the Russian Ruski Mir brings, brings when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, and I'll share with you again a picture at the end of my presentation of you know the city and how it looks like right now following Ruski Mir. Uh, but the good news is that the Ukrainians are controlling the southern sector of Ovchansk. And let me remind my viewers that there is a river that divides the city. Albeit it's not a massive river, but it's still a natural obstacle that the Russians need to cross. And you can see that they have been stopped around this uh, Vovcha River, which divides the city from the north to the south, which will not be a walk in the park for the Russians. They're trying to storm um, the village itself. So this contributes to a good natural obstacle that the Russians need to cross. Um, but I've heard a lot of chatter from pro-Russian telegram channels saying that essentially their offensive in this direction isn't very fruitful or isn't what they expected it to be. They anticipated better gains, and now they have to grind through every single village, um, and you know, not even village, but every single street to be able to drive out the Ukrainians. And they simply do not have the forces to get to Kharkiv because I think this was one of the main uh, alerts that was being given by several intelligence agencies that Kharkiv city is under Russian threat. Um, and we've been hearing that the last few months. Certainly that's not gonna happen um, the Ukrainians are better prepared, and you can see that, right, for the last almost two weeks, this is what the Russians have been able to get and gain. It's five to seven kilometers at best within Ukraine territory from the Russian border. This is not the gains that you would expect from the world's second largest army. Let me remind my viewers that Ukraine is not fighting some minuscule, you know, uh, army from a small country. This is Russia, and they've been preparing for this for decades. Are they super professional, highly advanced? No, but they have manpower. They have thousands, hundreds of thousands of men uh, available at their disposal. And they have thousands of armored vehicles. Even though they're Soviet vehicles, they can still do a lot of damage. And this is not the gains that you would expect from the world's largest, one of the world's largest army. And now Russia is pretty much, uh, you know, allocating almost half of its budget in the military. That's how serious they are about this. This is not the gains that you would expect from Russia. So we'll keep a close eye on this situation right now, but so far I can say that the situation is stable. And I can only hope that in the next few weeks with Ukraine rearming itself, they would be able to mount a counteroffensive in this direction to drive out the Russians back into Belgorod. There's also further um, sources claiming that potentially Russia can do a similar incursion in Sume. So we'll keep a close watch on this, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Again, as I've said, the Russians are trying to really uh, extend the um the battleground and also really stretch out ukrainian defenses so for them the more you know fronts they can open the better it is however it's not really sustainable for russia as well because um you know 
setting up the logistics, setting up, um, you know, the, the, the men necessary to conduct such offensives is difficult as well. It's not as easy uh, as, you know, in a few weeks. It takes months, if not even maybe even years to plan out operations as we've seen in the past. Uh, but certainly the Russians can't simply, you know, open like 10 other different fronts, right? And the Ukrainians also have reconnaissance. They have drones. They can visualize and see what's going on in Russian territory. And we'll talk about it at the end of my presentation as well, the frustration that I have with, of course, the American embargo on Ukraine hitting Russian soil with its weapons, with American weapons, uh, which could have really helped the Ukrainians in stopping this, you know, Kharkiv incursion in, uh, in Ukraine. Although I'm not saying this is entirely the fault of the West. We have witnessed uh, that the Ukrainians were not really building that first defensive line and they weren't as prepared as we thought they would be, which allowed the Russians to get quick, um, quick gains in the first two to three days. But the Ukrainians quickly reacted afterwards, and this is the result of this. So there is some blame to lay on um, also the command and the military leadership. So that's the situation for Kharkiv, overall stable. And uh, what I'm seeing is nothing catastrophic, but we'll keep a close eye a close watch on what the, the new developments are going to be here. And basically in Donbass, there's really nothing to report on. I can tell you that the front line remains mostly the same. Uh, in Luhansk, uh, the things are really the same. Nothing has changed, whether it be in Kupiansk or Leman, towards um, the city of Leman, the Russians obviously continue attacking, but they just don't have any, um, any big gains or any success here. So that's good news. Uh, the other two hottest fronts is, of course, uh, in Avdivka, northern Avdivka, and also in um, Krasnohorivka. And of, of course, how can I forget Bakhmut, so Chasivyar. Uh, so this is where the Russians are also really focusing because they understand how crucial it is to take Chasivyar. It's a big Ukrainian uh, fortress. And so far, I can tell you with Chasivyar that this weekend, the Russians tried to storm Ukrainian positions with about 20 armored vehicles in two separate attacks, if I remember correctly, and they were obliterated. And it was good to see that the Ukrainians finally have shells because you could see explosions of artillery, um, you know, happening on these armored Russian armored convoys attacking Chasivyar. So you can see that the Ukrainians are finally getting um, ammunition shells critical to stop these massive Russian attacks. And of course, the Russians are, have also been dumping uh, hundreds of glide bombs in Chasivyar alone. So this is also very difficult when you know that the Russians have such a destructive bomb that can pretty much obliterate uh, entire uh, buildings. But the Ukrainians are holding strong in Chasivyar and that is really good news. That is breaking Putin's ambitions to take over the administrative borders of Donetsk and Luhansk at the very least. Additionally, uh, again, uh, Ocheretene, Northern Avdivka, there's really nothing to report on. Uh, the Russians have been mostly stopped around the Ocheretina area, which is good news. So the Ukrainians were able to stabilize the situation following this partial breakthrough uh, north of Stepove, where the Russians quickly gained ground within a week and a half in, uh, in this area. But now it's good to see that the Ukrainians were able to stop them. And of course, there's more action going on in the south of Donetsk. Uh, Krasnohorivka, the Russians continue storming. Uh, it's another city of about 15,000 people. You can see that the Russians control about half of the city. Um, so it's a difficult situation here. And uh, you can see that they're doing different, different offensives. So not only Krasnohorivka, but also towards Heorivka. And uh, north of Krasnohorivka is also, um, of course, the northern um, Avdivka offensive that the Russians are conducting. So this is a very difficult front line for the Ukrainians. Um, and the Russians are trying to extend their gains outside of their default capital of Donetsk. And of course, in Zaporizhia, uh, nothing has really changed. So you can see some smaller offensive by, offensives by the Russians around Velika Novosilka. So essentially, those two fronts that the Ukrainians opened back in 2023, uh, nothing has changed in the last few weeks in Velika Novosilka and also in Robotine. So that is the first, the very first offensives that, offensive that the Ukrainians started uh, were, was towards the village of Robotene. They managed to take it, but you can see that right now it's a gray zone, so it's not under Ukraine control, but not under Russian control either. Um, and of course, this village doesn't exist anymore. This was a village of what, 500 people, 2,000 at best. There's nothing standing here. I can 
I've seen videos and images and Robotine is just uh, in rubble. And uh, I'm very surprised that the Ukrainians are able to hold this ground because of the pressure that they're getting from both sides and in the center. So that is from the west, the east, and the center of this front. And look how the Ukrainians are able to hold out. So this is really positive. Um, and the Ukrainians, of course, have now more shells, more ammunition. They have more drones. So they're able to uh, truly um, make the Russians pay a massive price for, uh, for their offensive in Robotin as well. So that is really the update. Uh, most of the changes I can tell you is around the south of Donetsk um, and also in Kharkiv where the Russians are doing really everything uh, to disturb Russian, uh, Ukrainian defenses and also try to stir up panic, right? Because let's not discount the psychological effect that the Russians are, are trying to, uh, to put on the Ukrainians, right? Look at us, we can start new offensives and you can't do anything about it. There's also a huge psychological war behind this as well. So overall, the situation is stable, and that's good news. Now, I want to go over some news that happened in the last few days. Coming from um, mostly in Luhansk and um, Crimea. So first of all, I wanted to talk about Luhansk because yesterday the Ukrainians conducted another effective strike on the Russian HQ. And this is really close to the Ukrainian-Russian border about 5 to 10 kilometers in the um, village of Yuvilene. So the Russians had set up their Ministry of Internal Affairs, so you can bet that there were a lot of um, commanders and you know highly placed leadership within this building when the Ukrainians struck it. And of course, the Ukrainians used the French-made Scalp cruise missiles. And as a result of this strike, apparently... It's claimed that uh, 13 soldiers were killed and another 26 were injured, and including the commander of the Southern Military District, Colonel General. Um, Colonel General, I'm not sure what his name is, but he was also injured, apparently. And um, one thing to note, though, is that we could see in this Ukraine strike that the Russians managed to intercept one, at the very least, one scalp missile. Now, this is not surprising because the scalp missile, if I remember correctly, um, its speed is about 700 to 800 kilometers per hour, if I remember correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong here. So it's not super fast. So it's not surprising that the Russians would be able to intercept. Um, but some still made, uh, ended up hitting the target. So that's great. And again, Ukraine also pursues a strategy of wiping out command and the leadership, military leadership, because the Russian military is heavily centralized and it's also rendering individual decision-making within the Russian military very ineffective um, without actually competent generals and leaders that are the front line. So you can see that this is one of these examples where the Russians have no choice but to send out generals, commanders, lieutenants, whatever, to the front line very close or closer to be able to conduct offensive operations. So this is a very good uh, strike by Ukraine. Now, next, another effective Ukrainian operation in uh, Crimea and so this is another very valuable Russian uh, missile carrier that was destroyed this is the cyclone um, and this uh, what is important about this ship is that uh, Russia could launch caliber missiles from it which have been terrorizing the Ukrainian people in Ukraine so now we can confirm that close to 30 percent of the Russian Black Sea fleet has been wiped out literally and Russia absolutely has no control over the Black Sea. It has no dominance. Um, and it's the myth that somehow the Russian uh, Navy is powerful and mighty has been destroyed by Ukraine with small drones. And uh, they've just been embarrassed totally, rendering essentially the Russian Navy ineffective and useless at this point, to the point that now uh, some of these um, you know, sailors are being transferred to fight in uh, the front lines because well what good is it for them to uh to sit in the port with without any active ships you know so this is really good news again i need to really highlight the fact that of course the the maritime war that ukraine has won is not the deciding factor in this war this is still going to be decided on the land but it's still a very powerful morale boost for ukraine and embarrassment for putin for not being able to really create a, a competent navy in the last few decades. So although this is very good news, this is not you know the difference maker in the war. Definitely not. 
And last but not least, I want to share with you guys the one image of the city of Vovchansk. And you can see that, well, everything has been destroyed by the Russians. And this is what the Russians are doing is, is what they do best, is pretty much destroy and ruin everything in their path. Um, and the fact that, you know, one of the frustration that I want to voice is, as you can see by this tweet by the Institute of, for the Study of War, they mentioned that the U.S. and other Western um, governments have set up limitations on Ukraine's ability to strike military targets in Russia. And they have created essentially a sanctuary in Russia's border areas from which Russian aircraft and also staging areas can conduct missile strikes against Ukrainian positions and settlements and where Russian forces and equipment can freely assemble before entering combat staging areas. So you can see that the fact that specifically the U.S. leadership is still enforcing this kind of embargo on Ukraine that they can hit Russian soil is, in my opinion, pure hip hypocrisy. You know that Ukraine now is in its third year of the war. And is it really too much to ask uh, to be able to hit Russia with Western weapons after everything we have witnessed the Russians do in the last almost, you know, two, over two years at this point? And we know that Sume is under threat and the Russians are also planning perhaps an incursion in Sume. Why is it so difficult to say that we can give the green light uh, to Ukraine, you guys deserve to hit Russian staging areas by your border. Because if there is no green light, then Russia is essentially, you know, getting a message that we can do this uh, endlessly and there's no repercussions. Whether it be 500 people, 1,000, 10,000 Russian soldiers, we're just going to open up different, you know, offensives. Not that it's going to be easy for Russia, but, you know, even a third one would hurt the Ukrainians, a third one in Sumit. Right, so this is problematic, and absolutely the United States, specifically the United States, because it's a global leader, needs to give the green light officially to Ukraine to be able to use attacams, whatever other weapons that the United States has provided to Ukraine, that is long-range missiles or bombs, to be able to hit Russian soil and military targets strictly. Of course, only military targets, whether it be staging areas, artillery sites, ammunition dumps, everything that is military should be a valid target for Ukraine. I mean, it's evident. You guys don't need me to tell you this. We, we understand that. Did we tell to Britain or other uh, countries in World War II to not hit Germany? You know, nobody did that. Everybody understood that Germany was a legitimate target. And same as Ru Russia is the same, right? Russia has started this war. Russia has conducted a brutal invasion of Ukraine. And they feel like there's, there's no punishment, right? Apart from the Ukrainian uh, drones right, which is a 100% Ukraine initiative. Uh, but we can see that clearly the Ukrainians are still not given the green light to hit Russian territory. And imagine how devastating that would be for the Russians. Imagine if the Ukrainians could use the Atacams on Russian airfields, military, um, you know, buildings or military bases with Atacams or other destructive weapons that the United States has. You know, imagine if that happened two years ago or even a year ago, right? And this is the problem, as Zelensky mentioned, is that every decision is taken a year or even two years later, too late, right? When the Russians have been able to adapt, because they're given time for the Russians to adapt. And they're no dummies, they can adapt. And as I've said in my several times in the past, the Russians, we can underestimate them. You know, they might have brutal techniques of warfare, but they don't care about their losses. You know, and they're able to adapt. They're able to find loopholes. They're able to find solutions to problems. And so that is a problem because if you're not allowing the Ukrainians to have some sort of advantage, you're just, you know, this drip feeding eventually will end with Ukraine's demise. So there needs to be decisiveness from the West. And, you know, I think part of it is, of course, because the U.S. administration is afraid of escalation. That's their slogan, too much escalation. But the Ukrainians have broken that myth. Yes, Russia is a nuclear um, power, but the Ukrainians have broken that myth. How many red lines have, has Ukraine crossed? How many oil refineries, oil depots in Russia, railway tunnels, uh, other administrative buildings did the Ukrainians blow up to, to show to the world that this is a myth, right? Russia won't respond with nuclear strikes if you hit oil depots or their metallurgical plants or their refineries. You know, it's a sign of strength that Russia respects and Russia understands. But if you're telling, no, Ukraine, don't do this, don't hit Russia, don't attack them, we're afraid, it's too escalatory. You're essentially allowing the Russians to do this in Ukraine. And with that comes thousands of innocent civilian lives, Ukrainian lives. They're perishing every single month. 
because of this lack of decisiveness. And then in the future, I really hope that it's not going to be us who are going to be telling uh, governments and other people, I told you so. We don't want to be in that situation. So I hope that in the future, the right decisions will be made by the West, especially the United States. And there's some positive signs as well, finishing with some positivity. positivity. Um, today, I saw that some congressmen and congresswomen have started signing a petition to um, convince the Biden administration to lift this type of embargo, uh, limiting the Ukrainians to utilize you know, American weapons just on Ukrainian soil. Uh, so let's see if that goes somewhere. But I really hope that by the end of this year, the Ukrainians will be given the opportunity to start striking Russian territory uh, and purely Russian military targets with American weapons, British weapons, uh, other weapons from the West. This is really important because they can make a difference. And this needs to be a symmetrical war, right? Russia is able to strike Ukraine with impunity, but Ukraine cannot. And it's fighting with a hand tied behind your back. It's not fair. And, you know, yeah, war is not fair, but it's not fair to set these types of conditions on the Ukrainians, which have suffered so much already. How much more loss can we tolerate, right? And then we're going to be surprised if Russia wins somehow, and then they continue attacking in the Baltics, in Moldova, in Romania, in Poland, and everybody's like, how could this have happened, right? We should have helped Ukraine. Well, you didn't. And I don't want to be in that situation where we say again, we told you so. So that's the video for today, guys. A huge thank you for support. Uh, thank you for supporting this channel and Ukraine. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe to my channel, like my video, leave me a comment about what I mentioned in this last pay is this in this last presentation uh, slide, and uh, yeah, a huge thank you, Slavo Ukraini.